Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. My name is Brian and we talk about Blu-rays here. Uh, today I am going to be talking to you about a new 4K UHD disc from the fine folks at Arrow Video. And uh, it is a 1990 film by Joel Schumacher and something I think of a cult item. Uh, not only because I feel like it's got that cult fan base, but also because it was remade in 2017. And I'm talking about Flatliners. Uh, which is a movie that um, I believe I saw in the theater. I think that's one of the reasons I'm connected to it. It's an R-rated movie from around the time when I would have first been able to go to R-rated movies. Um, and there's something about those films in particular, the, I don't know, the sort of f formerly forbidden nature of them, I guess, that um, I find, or at least I found compelling at the time. It was like, oh, I can do this now, you know? Um, so anyway, I think I saw it in the theater. Don't quote me on that. Maybe I saw it uh, on video, but it, it feels like one that was special to me. Like it felt like a new movie that I connected to, that I responded to in a way because of the cast, which is a pretty great cast. It includes, as you can see there, uh, Kiefer, T Kiefer Sutherland, uh, Julie Roberts, Kevin Bacon, Oliver Platt, and Billy Baldwin, uh, among others. And it is the story of some Loyola, I think they, I don't know if they say the university, but it's Loyola, Loyola University in Chicago that it's based at. They're medical students they are all kind of edgy and they have a little group that they sort of form and they, they come up with this, well, more Kiefer Sutherland's character comes up with this idea of coming back from the dead, of the afterlife and how they can, or he wants to anyway, uh, like basically try to kill himself, and then come back. And I think it's a really fascinating story in that way and was really compelling at the time because I was I was not quite into the full-blown horror mode that I have now. I'm not, I wasn't the full-blown horror fan that I am now. And it has horror elements. Um, it touches on some dark stuff and it... Uh, I think compelled me because of that because it was dark but also ultimately uplifting in some ways uh it was one of at least three film one of at least a group of at least three films that came out in 1990 that touched on supernatural afterlifey kind of elements uh the others were like jacob's ladder which is a much darker film but which has some like sort of dream image dream type spaces invading real life what's reality what's not kind of feelings um a very very dark film and also ghost the swayze film ghost dealt with the supernatural on a whole other level so this was there's something about the supernatural in 1990 but um and rewatching this film uh you know we see these characters and they like i said they they decide to do this experiment. Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland's character is able to talk the other medical students into helping him. And the idea is to go to a... Instead of doing it in a dull lab, uh, they do it, at least from the outside, uh, the Chicago Natural History Museum, I think, is where they... It's set up, I don't think it's... I don't know if it's supposed to be the museum or not, but somehow they're able to get in there. And, and it's there's a lot of visually interesting things that... Joel Schumacher does here and he's got great help with that and that um, cinematographer Jan DeBont shot this movie and it does look really good in this 4k I will say um, there's a very stylish quality to the film and they were able to use like Chicago architecture and all kinds of like camera moves and like slow motion different formats there's like high eight and you know, um, grainy video formats and some other things happening here. So it's not just 35, but it's also other things happening. And there's lots of colored filters and colored lights. And it's just, the, it's a muted 
film sort of there, there's not a brightness to the color except in some of these sequences where people are dead but each one of those I think is done slightly differently when we see Kiefer Sutherland's it's very bright it's outside it's different than the others and each I, I do think that's neat that the film gives a certain personality and visual style to each of their own uh afterlife whatever premonition visions if you want to call them and they all seem to have those and they all for the most part they're mostly dark you know so it's a thing where you see something after you're dead and then when you wake up it's it haunts you you it's there's visual hallucinations and sometimes physical in the case of Kiefer Sutherland he visualizes a bully that or a kid they used to pick on that's now getting revenge on him and physically beating him up and so there's lots of crazy stuff that happens in the movie but um there's some interesting things that come out in the features, and I'll talk about those in a second, but one of the things they talk about in multiple features is that Joel Schumacher and Jan de Bond, I can't remember if they both came up with it, but this idea of shooting it like an action movie, um, and I'll, I'll touch on it more when I talk about the Jan de Bond interview, but the, I'll, that idea is really interesting because there's an energy to this film that has a lot of people... <laughs> laying on tables, you know, getting, uh, you know, put out to die, basically, uh, while four people stand around looking at them. And there's just all kinds of visual things that they do to make it interesting. One of them that always stood out to me is this really bizarre, when I think about it, uh, heating and cooling blanket that basically looks like a giant plastic sheet of bubble wrap that has these, like, neon, um, like lines through it like sort of um wires but they're thicker it's almost like le like this th they're really thick and the blanket somehow has the ability to both cool you and when you when it's cooling the neon is blue and heat you up and when it heats you up it's it's orange and red ish um i looked up and i don't know if that technology actually exists or not it was one that i was watching this time when i was like wait how could that even work like how could you have a blanket that could cool you and heat you it's it was whatever I took it for granted at the time maybe it is a possibility I don't know um but watching it this time it didn't really make sense that the same blanket could do those things and how do you do that like is it he heating and cooling the liquid in the tubes I don't know whatever it worked but it but visually it's very interesting it definitely stands out and makes those scenes a little more dynamic on top of the camera moves and the angles that are used when you're watching the other people look at the person on the table you know they they basically each take turns going under and trying to die for a certain amount of time and I'd forgotten about like this bidding that happens basically Kiefer does it for like a minute and then the next person's like I want 120 and the next person's that's trying to go is like I'll do a minute and a half and then they let the person who will do the most time go for whatever reason um get come closer to brain death is gutsier so they can go and so there's this bidding that happens where they keep saying I'll go longer than you'll go and so I should be next and it's fascinating stuff um but there were some things that came to mind while I was watching it and there's a lot of stuff that was used to describe this film like the way I was thinking about it weirdly was a uh, dead poet society with a group of med students with a little bit of nightmare in Elm street, you know, uh, because they like dead poet society, which came out the year before they go and they, um, do this ritualistic thing and it gets, you know, it gets them in trouble and it's a very secret ceremonial thing, you know? Um, and there is sort of this element of entering dreams or in this case, you know, the afterlife space and having that come back and haunt you much like a nightmare on Elm street sort of thing or whatever. There's also like some Frankenstein -y stuff in here. There's like some mad scientist -y kind of stuff, which I kind of dig. Um, but interestingly, uh, in the commentary with Brian Reisman and Max every, um, which I really dug, I really enjoyed the commentary track. Um, they go into all kinds of detail and anecdotes uh, that are fun and interesting, and there's just tons of information, some about like real medical stuff, some about production stuff, and some thematic things, talking about film trends at the time. I mean, it's a wide-ranging conversation, and that is one of the things I like about it, is it flows freely as a conversation between two guys that uh, I just think are really sharp and I really enjoyed uh, everything they brought in. There wasn't a lot of dead space. There wasn't a ton of 
commenting on what's happening or being snarky really it was it was really talking about things relevant to the film you know and in a great way and and so it was a really wonderful commentary track so hats off to those guys but one of the things they mentioned they call out a lot of anecdotes and one was an interview that Kiefer Sutherland did with Fangoria around the time of the release of the movie where he called the movie The Breakfast Club Dies and uh, St. Elmo's Funeral, which of course St. Elmo's Fire was the movie that uh, Joel Schumacher had done previous to this. Um, and yeah, so I thought that was an interesting way to describe it. I don't Breakfast Club Dies maybe a little bit. I don't know about St. Elmo's Funeral. It doesn't exactly work, but it's it's catchy. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a fascinating film and one that I, 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 like I said, I have some kind of weird relationship to it. That's nostalgic that I can't quite put my finger on. Cause I can't remember exactly when I first saw it, but I do like these actors. They were definitely, uh, it actors of the time and young actors that I found compelling and dynamic. Um, all of them. I mean, really Oliver Platt always stands out to me cause he, as they mentioned in the commentary as well, he's the only tried and true character actor of the bunch the rest are like leading men and women that had had their own had or would have their own movies um in the future platt not as much he's almost always there in a supporting role but always great and he's wonderful in this is sort of this guy trying to document his rise as a surgeon and he's sort of the voice of reason like what are you guys doing this is crazy that kind of stuff and he's really good at that he's just i don't know i just really love his performance here um, but, oh, and they also mentioned in the commentary that he was discovered, I guess, by Bill Murray, uh, and that he recommended Platt to Jonathan Demme, who used him in Married to the Mob, I think, and then this is only like his fourth film, and he's still pretty young when he does this movie, but it's, a, he's a great fit for this group, like, it's an interesting group. Um, Billy Baldwin's character is kind of sleazy, it's, it's almost like a preview of a Sliver, I think where he's like taping women while he's having sex with them. And that's the thing that sort of is haunting him. And really, yeah, he's really kind of a creep in the movie. And it, and it really does kind of remind me of Sliver anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, each character has their own demons. You know, the Julia Roberts character has this thing with her dad. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there. But like I said, 4K looks really good. Lots of blues and reds and uh, stylized lighting, smoke, all kinds of cool stuff. So it really, um, it really worked well on the 4k format for me. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm trying to think about the, um, <laughs> there is another, <laughs> another thing they mentioned in the commentary, which I love just an aside is that, um, they call back to the, moment in pop star never stop never stopping when bill Hader's character who's a guitar tech uh it's just a quick aside where he shows that he flatlines for fun like that's what he does and he wakes up and he talks about uh taking a dump and uh they bring up the idea that when you die the first thing you do is you evacuate your bowels and so that all these characters ultimately probably would have been on the table you know um evacuating their bowels and and so but they don't ever touch on that that they don't ever clean up there's none of that and i just never for whatever reason that never occurred to me and i was suddenly like oh yeah there should be a lot more grossness in this movie if they're dying uh, but anyway okay so um i'm trying to think i have a bunch of notes on the different features here okay so this is what the 4k looks like i don't think oh there is some alternate artwork so you have the original artwork on the back. Um, and uh, so it's got some nice features. Uh, all the interviews, I believe, are produced and directed by a friend of the show, Elijah Drenner, and they're done very well, and I enjoyed uh, all of them. Um, but so you have, let's see here. I'll start with the Jan de Bont interview because I think that was probably my favorite. It's Jan de Bont uh, and Chief Lighting Technician Edward Ayer uh, it's called Visions, Vision of Light, Visions of Light, and it's about 18 and a half minutes, and it's great. Yandabont goes into all kinds of detail about how they shot the movie, and it's really um, neat to hear about you know his suggestions to Joel Schumacher, one of which was for him to watch uh, The Fourth Man, which is a film that Yandabont had shot for Paul Verhoeven, and how... 
not that it was exactly similar, but it dealt with sort of a multiple planes of reality or something like that that might be good in terms of how they shot those to apply, at least in terms of exploring ideas, to this film. And Schumacher did watch it, and he totally went for it and thought it was just a great reference point for some ideas that they obviously would then explore in this film. So I thought that was really neat. Uh, he talked about the shooting like an action movie, and what that really meant was more energetic camera moves. Like, not like literally like an action movie, but when, they, when they're around the table, the camera is moving, and just a general dynamism to the movement of the camera and the shots to kind of make it feel just like things are moving a little quicker. And it works. It really does make the film feel that much more um, propulsive in that way. So that's really cool. Uh, he talks about Chicago architecture and stuff like that. And then there's some really cool stuff with um, with uh, Air where he's talking about... Uh, Edward Ayer, where he's talking about how they did a lot of the shots, the lighting stuff they were doing, and just fascinating. Like, I really dug the interview overall. Really good stuff. So that's uh, one. Then you have um, you have The Conquest of Our Generation, a brand new uh, video interview with screenwriter Paul Filardi. Uh, interesting. He's really high on this script, and he should be proud of it. Uh, and it was obviously a big um deal for him you know a, a script he had previously sold some tv scripts like a macgyver script and some other stuff uh and this was like his first big deal sale uh he talks about capturing the zeitgeist of his generation and you know gets gets really into the ideas that he evolved in this script and and that's fair uh but fascinating to hear how he was inspired uh he he said one of the things that inspired him was accountability and how uh, that he felt like a, what a lot of people really want is accountability. And the idea of a lot of religions is based on accountability and this notion that if you live a good night life and you are kind to people, that in the afterlife you'll be treated well. Whereas if you are a jerk and not nice, uh, in the afterlife you will be punished. And that a lot of people really latch on to that idea and, and that their religions do so as well. And that that was something he really wanted to explore with this script. Um... He said he had a friend that had called him or talked to him and said he had died for like 15 seconds and he had asked him like, did you see anything? And the guy said he couldn't really remember, but that just having that experience triggered something in him. And yeah, just talking about the selling of the script and some themes and things he's working out in it. And so that that's about a 19 minute interview. Then we have uh, Hereafter which is a an interview with... These are all brand new, and like I said, uh, by Elijah Drenner. Uh, it is an interview with first assistant director John Kretschmer. And more production stuff. Um, you know, he was talking about... They were, he has lots of notes about Schumacher, things that Schumacher said and did, one of which was that they were going to shoot New York or that the studio was pushing him to do that, and Schumacher said, no, Chicago, and he's... Kretschmer's from Chicago, and so he's totally on board with that idea. Uh, he talks about selecting Loyola University because they needed a university that was on a lake because they have this great, ambitious opening helicopter shot that flies over the lake and comes up to Kiefer Sutherland on the shore. And he says this great opening line, which is, uh, today's a great day to die or something like that. And how difficult it was to get that shot. <laughs> Uh, but that was one of the reasons they chose that location and um, talked about how Jan de Bont worked, that he worked quickly, but he had like a two-hour setup he needed in the morning. And once he did that, he could move relatively fast, which is really interesting to hear because he does a great job. So I'm always curious how um, those folks work. He talks about the production designer, which that's the next interview um, is with, uh, it's called Restoration. And that one is a brand new video interview with production designer Eugenio Zanetti and art director Larry Lundy. Um, and that is, of course, about the production design of the film and uh, Chicago locations again. Like, they, they, it's always interesting to hear these different takes on some of the same uh, ideas, like Chicago and some other things that they did in the film. Uh, that one is about almost 11 minutes long. Uh, decent interview, and then Atonement, 
is another interview that's 11 minutes and 35 seconds. It's a brand new interview with composer James Newton Howard and orchestrator um, Chris Boardman. Uh, and they talk about the score of the film, which is a really fascinating score for Newton Howard. It's it's at times ethereal and gothic and choral, but also uh, synthy and just otherworldly in this really cool way. And that, I think, also adds to the propulsiveness of the movie when it needs to and the epicness. Uh, it's a good score. Like, it's really interesting. And so it's cool to hear him talk about that. Uh, and then lastly, there's Dressing for... That one's about uh, 1135. And Dressing for Character is the last one, and that's a brand-new interview with costume designer Susan Becker. Uh, and that is about six and a half minutes talking about working on... Um, uh, she worked on St. Elmo's Fire before this and then this film and uh, different costume stuff. It's it's good. It's it's a good short interview. But overall, a really nice package from Arrow and a good transfer that is, uh, I should have mentioned, brand new 4K restoration from the original negative approved by director of photography, Jan de Bont. Um, and so that looks wonderful. And this is just a 4K and it also comes with a nice booklet which I definitely don't want to neglect. Uh, and the booklet includes two essays. You have Land of the Almost Dead, Flatliners, and a Historical Overview of Near-Death Experience by Amanda Reyes, as well as See You Soon, The Surprising Spirituality of Joel Schumacher, Joel Schumacher's Flatliners by Peter Tungett, as well as um, a little bit about the restoration. Uh, wonderful essays by both. And great to have them in this set. It really just is a wonderful package overall from Arrow for a movie that, like I said, I think has a cult following, but seeing it on this new transfer and listening to all the features and everything really made me, um, I don't know, kind of dig the movie even more. Uh, the last time I watched it, I think I liked it, but I was in maybe a little bit annoyed by it or something or the concessions of it but this time I let some of that go and there was just a lot of interesting stuff explored in it ultimately so uh well worth picking up if you're interested uh the new 4k from Arrow so anyway thank you so much for your time thank you for watching thank you for listening and I'll talk to you soon bye bye